Um, I'm Mike Murphy, and I direct the Hank Center here at Loyola. It's my uh, privilege to honor you, or to honor you, to, yeah, to honor you with, uh, <laughs> with all the good things you do. So congratulations, everybody. Um, now, to welcome you to Loyola uh, University of Chicago, we're happy to have you on our campus, and we're glad you're here to listen to this wonderful talk and to dialogue a bit with Bill. Um, some quick business to, before we begin. Uh, this is uh, the Hank Center for the Catholic Intellectual Heritage. We do lots of different things. Uh, on our own, and then really in collaboration with other university partners. Uh, we have a very exciting um, series this semester. It's part two of our 1968 series. And we're looking back at this really convulsive year, uh, 1968, and finding lots of uh, uh, things to speak about. I mean, if history does not repeat itself, it certainly rhymes, I think has been said. And some things are rhyming pretty um, explicitly and clearly today. So we are looking at lots of things. I'm happy to see my partner in crime, Dr. Shermer's back here, Dr. Nixon's in the house, uh, other folks who helped us, hi Michelle. Um, Mike Shook's always a big help. Uh, and then some, some panelists here uh, as well have, are coming to join in. And uh, also, we're calling this the start of Berrigan Week as well. And I wanna uh, welcome Amy Jaffe from Rhode Island who's here, uh, and we're happy to have the exhibit, second floor of Damon. Uh, for you to come and uh, take a look at Daniel Berrigan and William Stringfellow. Uh, so that's the general idea, uh, and we do things like that all the time, and it's our privilege to do it. Uh, if you want to see what we're doing, we have flyers in the back corner, and you can sign, in, uh, sign up for our email list to be on our list to see what we're doing and be our guest and, uh, and talk with us, dialogue with us, um, and uh, we're happy if you would do that. We also are happy to, to, to sell books tonight that Bill has written, and Bill is a prolific author. I'll mention some things in a moment in his, uh, as I introduce him. But we have a thing tonight, we wanna really um, make sure you know about William Stringfellow. And so we are going to uh, encourage you, uh, especially if you're a student, to uh, have a book on us. So those books that Bill has, has written uh, and edited, The Essential Writings of William Stringfellow, are going to be available to students first, free, courtesy of the Hank Center and, and Bill. And Bill has other books for sale as well that we're going to ask $20 for. So uh, if you can, you know, one or both or three, if you don't have cash or a check, a check, uh, <laughs> you can do a, the old fashioned um, IOU to sign your name down in the Hank Center and you can come by and give us $20 and we'll um, make sure it gets to where it has to go. We don't have a square, is it called square? Is that that technology? We don't have that, but that's coming next in the Hank Center. Uh, the Catholic intellectual tradition is really a beautiful one, but it sometimes can move rather slowly. So, um, and, and it really does need to get with the times in lots of ways, as I'm sure we all agree. Okay, let me introduce Bill. Bill Wiley Kellerman is a nonviolent uh, community activist, a member of the Detroit Catholic Worker, a retired Methodist pastor. As a seminarian at Union Theological Seminary in New York City, he fell under the, under the sway and mentorship of one Daniel Berrigan, SJ, and also William Stringfellow, and he was a friend of theirs until their, their deaths. Bill has been engaged in liturgical direct action for five decades. He's authored six books, among them Principalities in Particular, A Practical Theology, which is from Fortress, and William Stringfellow, Essential Writings from Orbis. Both those books are available at our book table. Uh, he also, I've noticed, has written a book about Detroit, his beloved Detroit recently. Is that right, Bill? Right. Yeah, and I think it's, it's called Where Waters Go Round. Is that right? Yeah. It looks like a good read as well. Bill's also served as series editor for the republication of Stringfellow's writing. This is a whip and stock book. And he is co-founder of Word and World and faculty at Ecumenical Theological Seminary in Detroit. Uh, he's also a member of the Homrick Nine, uh, who have been prosecuted for blocking water shutoff trucks, among other things, I'm sure. Um, and he is currently responsible for direct action with the Michigan Poor People's Campaign. And I think you were in court this morning, Bill, on that path? Yes, was in court. I'm on Thursday. Well, okay, there it is. Uh, now, here's this. Um, this is what, with Bill, and he writes this, this is what he wrote to me. In Jesus, he bets his life. On the gospel nonviolence, good news to the poor, the word made flesh. Freedom from the power of death. Please welcome Bill, Kiley, uh, Bill Wiley Kellerman, excuse me. If, if you don't 
one? You can use that one as well. I'd rather use that one. Okay, then I'll take that one. Good evening. Is this uh, working? Can you hear me? Good. <clears throat> it's really, uh, it is an honor to, uh, uh, to be here. I'm very grateful to uh, Michael Murphy and the, and the Hank Center for the invitation. Uh, and also to the Hank Center just for recognizing the importance of Dan Berrigan's work in life and work, I'll say. Um, in Catholic intellectual thought and uh, heritage. Um, 60 years of uh, word and deed, in his case, um, is in a certain sense bearing fruit now uh, under Francis, where uh, the just war theory is being upended, uh, gospel nonviolence is actually being embraced, um, and and in a certain sense, that that work, his his life and work, and the communities that he was part of, are undergird that and uh, and yield it. Berrigan Week is right on time, in that in exactly that sense. Uh, the last time I spoke at Loyola was in the Bush Cheney years and my daughter uh, Lydia who was a Loyola student uh, part of the um, student ministry group in Umbutu community organized a series on issues of impeachment um, I don't I don't know if that's planting a seed or not <laughs> uh, but I, she invited me to come give a talk on surveillance uh, which was certainly an impeachable issue uh, in that uh, era. And, uh, and, and my reflections were uh, biblical and theological as well as really concrete and uh, political. That talk <laughs> is in uh, principalities in particular. Um, because of both the exhibit that the folks on Block Island have pulled together and the, and the film, uh, short film by Sue Hagedorn that will be showing tomorrow uh, night with, with her presence, um, I titled uh, my remarks for the evening, uh, William Stringfellow and Daniel Berrigan, The Politics of Friendship. Um, and I'll flesh that out. Um, notice that I didn't call it the politics of friending, uh, though that is part, that whole phenomenon where uh, friend becomes a verb and has to do with tapping a touchpad, um, is part of the context in which uh, I'm going to say deep and real and substantial and incarnate uh, friendship uh, needs to be heard and uh, understood. Um, to that end, I want to begin with a text. Uh, it's a paragraph from a long letter, many of you will know this, uh, which Thomas Merton wrote to Jim Forrest. Uh, who's recently the biographer of uh, Dan Berrigan and uh, at one time uh, was a hope to be speaker in, uh, in this week. Uh, Forrest was at that time, 1966, uh, a staff member of the Catholic Peace Fellowship and had at the time kind of fallen into despair about uh, about his work and conveyed that to Merton. Uh, and so Merton wrote him a long letter. Uh, I'm just going to read a paragraph of it. It's, it's kind of widely known. I think you, some of you will recognize that it's, it ends up in blogs and posters and, uh, and other forms. I see it over young people's uh, computer tables. And it's often called a letter to a young activist. And then this, do not depend on the hope of results. When you're doing the sort of work you've taken on, essentially an apostolic work, 
You may have to face the fact that your work will be apparently worthless and even achieve no result at all, if not perhaps results opposite of what you expect. As you get used to this idea, you start more and more to concentrate not on the results, but on the value, the rightness, the truth of the work itself. And there too a great deal has to be gone through, as gradually you struggle less and less for an idea and more and more for specific people. The range tends to narrow down, but it gets more real. In the end, as you yourself mentioned, it's the reality of personal relationships that saves everything. Since I'm the uh, first speaker in the series, I kind of wondered if it was incumbent on me to say something about who Daniel Berrigan is. Uh, so let me just briefly. Uh, he's a Jesuit priest, uh, an award-winning poet, and a convicted federal felon uh, twice over. Uh, he was an author of uh, 50 books, uh, all of them theological, if you will, some essay and journal-like uh, books, particularly those that uh, were written in prison or in the underground times when he was underground. Uh, but the majority are either poetry or biblical commentary. Um, and the, those latter volumes um, all the, cover all the prophets systematically. Uh, the Book of Kings, which of course is a political book. Exodus, another. Revelation, another. And, uh, and much about uh, Jesus and, and even Paul. They're not what you could properly call critical works, uh, though Biblically, he was familiar, well-read with uh, critical literature, and it informed kind of was the landscape uh, in which he wrote. Uh, but uh, his, his writing was much more engaged, uh, if you will, explicit about the social location uh, from which he and his community read the book uh, and entered into a biblical conversation, which was a place of nonviolent resistance to empire, and which is to say, uh, not a safe and objective reading of a text. Uh, that's also to say, in terms of deeds and action, that along with his brother Philip, uh, he virtually pioneered new forms of nonviolent uh, uh, action, specifically uh, I've taken to calling liturgical direct action. Uh, action which is public, uh, ritualized, sacramental, uh, and prayerful, uh, and in a certain sense uh, reflecting and arising out of the second, in accord with the Second Vatican Council, I want to say, the opening of liturgy and sacrament uh, to the world. So, for example, in 1968 uh, was the notorious uh, draft board raid in Catonsville, Maryland, where he and eight others, along with Philip, uh, went into the draft board, removed 1A files of people who were uh, drafted into Vietnam, they removed those, took them to the parking lot, and burned them with homemade napalm, surrounding the fire with uh, a circle of uh, prayer, of uh, repentance, to say the least. Uh, Dorothy Day, who had qualms about the action initially, uh, in an address to the liturgical conference, uh, referred, to it, referred to it as an act of prayer. Uh, William Stringfellow later called it a politically informed exorcism. Uh, and then again in 1980, again with Philip uh, and uh, uh, six others, uh, they entered a General Electric 
plant in Pennsylvania where nuclear warheads were being made and uh, literalized uh, Isaiah's prophecy to beat swords into plowshares and used hammers to, d to uh, damage and unmake or remake uh, uh, the weapons. Uh, just as uh, Catonsville spawned, uh, Catonsville, in that case, the draft board action spawned hundreds of other draft board actions uh, in this country, including one here in Chicago, you may know, the Chicago 15. Uh, actually, when I was a college student, uh, I had a, uh, a poster on my, on my dorm wall I don't know if it was a Corita Kent or not, but it was uh, like a very brightly colored uh, orange and, and yellow uh, poster. They, they had acted on Pentecost, so the text of the poster was from Acts 2, and it said, these men are not drunk as you imagine, it's only the third hour of the day. Um, and then I'm going sideways here very quickly uh, later. <laughs> Uh, later, I had a conversation with Joe Mulligan, uh, a Jesuit priest who was part of that action, uh, and, uh, and I told him about my poster, and he said, actually, we were drunk. <laughs> he said we had to wait out outside the draft board all night, and it was bitterly cold, and our friends kept bringing hot toddies. So by morning, we were schnockered <laughs> when we went in. So uh, anyway. Uh, the plowshares uh, action has likewise spawned uh, uh, several decades of similar actions, the most recent of which uh, took place in Kings Bay, Georgia, at the Trident Basin on uh, April the 4th, uh, the anniversary of Dr. King's uh, assassination. Uh, Liz McAllister, uh, wife and partner of uh, Philip at, in the Jonah House community, was one of those uh, seven, I think, who uh, cut the fence and broke in, went to a couple of different places, poured blood, specifically naming uh, the giant triplets, now I'd say the giant quadruplets in their, in their view, and in the view of the Poor People's Campaign, now current, um, they were addressing these giant, what Dr. King called the, the giant triplets, racism, militarism and extreme materialism, uh, which require a revolution of values to be uh, addressed and uh, fought. Um, Liz of that group is I, maybe the only one still currently in prison, in, in jail, waiting trial. The others are all out uh, and um, tethered, but that trial is to start shortly. Uh, Daniel died uh, two years ago, just shy of uh, 95. I have friends here who are at the funeral, maybe others of you. Uh, I was uh, honored not only to be part of the procession from the Catholic worker to uh, the church, but to be asked to say a few words the, uh, at the wake uh, uh, the night before at uh, St. Ignatius. Um, I had thought I might read a poem about Dan, but I, uh, I think I'll, instead I'll just say a little bit about how I, I met him. I was a seminary student in New York at Union in 1972, and he had just been released from Dan, Danbury Prison for the Catonsville action, and came to New York uh, actually to teach at Woodstock College, the Jesuit uh, school, um, and we had cross-registration at Union. Uh, and uh, so uh, we, we were in a class with him on uh, the Book of Revelation and, and Jacques Ellul, the, the French uh, biblical theologian, social historian, uh, who both Bill Stringfellow and, and Dan were very taken with. Um, and when he when he lectured on, uh, on the book of Revelation, sometimes he'd write on the board, but uh, it was almost uh, ecstatic poetry that he was speaking about 
uh, the apocalypse of John. And I remember more than once, I mean, we were all furiously taking, trying to take notes. Uh, and uh, I remember once saying, oh, wait, wait what, did, what did you just say? And he, and he just like almost came out of a trance and said, I don't know. <laughs> and then it was lost, whatever it was, uh, but not entirely. Um, the way that he read scripture, and particularly in, in that course, but even more with his life, really knocked me off my horse. Uh, uh, I'd grown up in an evangelical church and took the Bible seriously, but nobody, nobody read the book with life and death seriousness the way that, that he did. And uh, like everything, everything was staked on this. And uh, uh, I kind of freaked in. <laughs> Uh, I could barely talk uh, for a stretch. Um, I knew I was going through a conversion, uh, and and he noticed. And I have a really vivid memory of him calling my name down the hall and uh, and inviting me up for scotch, and then you know come back on Tuesday for some tea. And suddenly I'm meeting with him on a couple times a week. And like a, a good evangelical, I'd never heard of spiritual direction, but I'd been sucked into it. And uh, he's putting Dorothy Day and Merton in my hand. And, uh, and that was the beginning, not only of a serious mentorship, but a, a kind of a lifelong uh, friendship. Um, and I've seen him do that to other people as well. I, 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 I could tell more than one story. Uh, a friend of ours at, at Union at the time, I mean, he wasn't a student. He kind of came and crashed with us. He was dying of cancer. And he, so he joined us in Dan's class. And we were going around in introductions and, you know, say your name and a little bit about yourself. And, and he said, you know, my name's Mel Hollander. I'm dying of cancer, which I think he thought would be a, you know, a stopper and a shocker. And, and Dad said, oh, that must be interesting. <laughs> and like, that was a stopper and a shocker for Mel. <laughs> and, and, uh, and I was like, wait, yeah, maybe it is interesting. <laughs> uh, and uh, he, he kind of came to life and ended up uh, doing work in, that, in, the, in the 70s with Vietnamese refugees. I, it was like Dan just called him uh, into life. Um, and as I say, I, I got more of those stories. Um, so of the two, Dan and Bill, it's probably Stringfellow who I need to say the more about uh, with this group, I'm guessing. Uh, as a college student in the 40s, he was uh, internationally known in the uh, ecumenical student Christian movement which really was a movement and really was uh, uh, a global movement at the, uh, at the time. Uh, later, when he, as he put it, suffered a conversion by reading the Bible uh, as a, as a, in the army uh, in Germany, uh, he came to look back on the student years as kind of pharisaical. Uh, that that's when he was a professional Christian uh, and making a career of being a Christian. And he, you know, he later foreswore, he said he died to career uh, and regarded career itself as a, as a kind of principality. In 1956, uh, he graduated from Harvard Law School and was poised for a, a lucrative career, right? Uh, and instead, he made for East Harlem, uh, where he lived and did street law before there was such a thing, before there was a legal services corporation or uh, any of that, uh, with the support of the East Harlem Protestant Parish uh, there. Uh, that moved to the margin many of his friends thought was a bad career move, uh, which indeed 
you could say it was. Um, and there in East Harlem, because of the way folks on the street uh, spoke about the man or the cops or the welfare bureaucracy or the absentee landlords or the philanthropic enterprises as though they were predatory creatures arrayed against the community, um, he began to pay attention to the New Testament references to the principalities and powers, um, which had been hermeneutically, uh, basically going back to the fourth century, had been projected into outer space, right? The words rulers, authorities, dominions, thrones had no political reference. They were all about stuff in spiritual outer space, right? And, uh, and it was really, I mean, you could name some historical moments. One was uh, the resistance to uh, Hitler and Nazism, where suddenly people are paying attention to these terms in a new and concrete way. And Stringfellow was one of those who helped bring the principalities back onto the map of uh, Christian and uh, biblical uh, social ethics. Um, very like Bar Daniel Berrigan, he was never fully embraced by the academy, right? Um, he, Stringfellow, uh, uh, even though he had that huge influence, people <laughs> would read him, use his stuff, you know, he wouldn't be acknowledged or footnoted, you know, uh, but he really shaped what was uh, restructuring. Walter Wink, who did so much, has done so much recent work on the principalities, he, he said he, uh, he reread Bill's works and was embarrassed by how much he'd, Stringfellow he'd been uttering without crediting or even realizing it. It had just kind of gotten into him. Um, um, in 1962, here in Chicago, uh, at the University of Chicago Rockefeller Chapel, uh, he was the only non-academically trained theologian, he was a lawyer, who queried Karl Barth, the uh, great uh, Protestant Swiss theologian, uh, in his one visit to America. And uh, Stringfellow's conversation with him, questions, and, con and it was a conversation, uh, were substantially about the principalities, uh, about the state uh, in Romans 13, explicitly about the principalities, about the confessing movement in Germany. And at the end of the exchange, Karl Barth stood up, looked at the audience and said, you should listen to this man, mm -hmm. and pointed to him, right? And then the following year, uh, in 63, uh, at the big pink uh, hotel, <laughs> Uh, where Sheridan turns into uh, the Edgewater Hotel, uh, the, first, uh, congr the first conference, national conference on religion and race was held. Martin Luther King was the, the headliner uh, at that. Um, Rabbi Abraham Heschel was the keynoter to the, to the week, and Stringfellow was a respondent to, uh, to Heschel. Uh, and he said a number of things that, that stirred uh, controversy. Uh, but the, the most substantial one had to do with naming white supremacy as a demon, as a principality. And I'll, I'll read to you. This is in the book that Michael's making available. Um, this is, this is, these are his remark, part of his remarks. From the point of view of either biblical religion, the monstrous American heresy is in thinking that the whole drama of history takes place between God and human beings. But the truth, biblically, theologically, and empirically is quite otherwise. 
The drama of this history takes place amongst God and human beings and the principalities and powers, the great institutions and ideologies active in the world. It's the corruption and shallowness of humanism which beguiles Jew or Christian into believing that human beings are masters of institution or ideology. Or to put it a bit differently, racism is not an evil in human hearts or minds. Racism is a principality, a demonic power, a representative image, an embodiment of death over which human beings have little or no control, but which works its awful influence over their lives. Now don't miss the paradox here in the next line. This is the power with which Jesus Christ was confronted and which at great and personal cost he overcame. A few years later, uh, because of uh, radical illness, uh, Stringfellow relocated with his partner, uh, Anthony Town, to Block Island. Um, uh, he moved from Manhattan, and that was a move that would figure prominently in his friendship uh, and the saga with Dan. And from there, uh, in an environment which he termed monastic, um, he wrote his most substantial books on the, on, the, on the powers. And partly it was that short step off of America, he said, off of the United States, right, uh, off the edge, that seemed to enable him to size up the nation in its apocalyptic guise as Babylon. Uh, and no one's written theology more uh, cogently about American empire than, than Stringfellow. Uh, this is a, from an introduction to uh, conscience and obedience. The effort is to comprehend the nation, to grasp what is happening right here and now to the nation, and to consider the destiny of the nation within the scope and style of the ethics and the ethical metaphors distinctive to the biblical witness in history. The task here is to treat the nation within the tradition of biblical politics, to understand America biblically, not the other way around, not, to put it in an appropriate awkward way to construe the Bible Americanly. Maybe, maybe we'll get a chance to unpack that uh, a little bit together. Uh, Dan and Bill met as writers uh, and their friendship was fertile soil for their writing conversation. Uh, in terms of the meeting itself, Dan had written a manuscript, uh, They Call Us Dead Men, uh, which substantially, if uh, obliquely, uh, reflected his experience at the Gethsemane retreat that Thomas Merton had called in uh, uh, 1964 uh, on the spiritual roots of, of protest. Um, and uh, several of the essays, particularly on technology, uh, kind of came directly out of that conversation. And there were parts of the book that were reflect material that he presented at the, at the retreat. Um, Dan had read Bill's book about his experience in East Harlem uh, called My People is the Enemy. And it prompted him to send a thank you note for the book and also to ask if he would write a little introduction, a few pages, for the beginning of uh, They Call Us Dead Men, um, uh, introducing it. And he, he, uh, Dan wrote me about their meeting. He said, as to the intro he did to an early book of mine, when I wrote to ask him the favor, he said, why not come over for supper? Their eerie was just across Central Park, 
I went, and that started things that never thank God end. He continues, the two dwelt in a penthouse atop a rundown building on the Upper West Side. The ample rooms had a lived-in doggy look, an outsized terrace faced east and south. Out there, I was to learn, country matters flourished. Not only corn and tomatoes were produced, but for a brief time until dismayed neighbors summoned the health department, rabbits as well. <laughs> Heady years, people forever coming and going. Among church folk of migratory pro proclivities, there arose an unspoken dogma. The string felonian menage and management were to be accounted among the prime sights and sounds of the city. Domestic partying was frequent. There was a hilarious all-night auction of art, a fundraiser for SNCC or CORE. Corita Kent donated several of her incomparable serigraphs, but the non-stop pace was taking a steep toll. Bill was losing weight and failing alarmingly." End quote. Stringfellow's introduction to Dan's book signaled kind of how quickly their friendship had taken. He began, this passionate one, this meek poet, this exemplary human being, this priest of Christ, now gives us a wise, lucid, compelling, and edifying testament, affirming the sacramental integrity of human life in this world. <clears throat> I'm mindful that uh, we gather, I know the 50 years uh, anniversaries are very much in the air. Uh, two weeks from now is actually the 50th anniversary of the Cadenceville trial. Um, uh, and each evening after the courtroom uh, was adjourned, uh, people would move to St. Ignatius Church and there would be what was called a festival of life uh, beyond the long reach of the law was uh, poetry and music and preaching and doxology uh, and art. Uh, and Stringfellow, who was at that time kind of at the, really at the peak of his illness, uh, appeared uh, and struggled to um, climb into the pulpit. Um, And this is what he uh, rose to say. Remember now that the state has only one power it can use against you, against human beings, death. The state can persecute you, prosecute you, imprison you, exile you, execute you. All of these mean the same thing. The state can consign you to death. The grace of Jesus Christ in this life is that death fails. There is nothing the state can do to you or to me which we need fear. He was stunned when the congregation burst into uh, a standing ovation and then broke into song. <coughs> uh, the trial uh, actually did issue in a deadly guilty verdict. And within weeks, Dan was at uh, Stringfellow's bedside in Manhattan, uh, where finally his illness had been accurately diagnosed, and he decided to undergo ex radical experimental surg surgery, which the doctors didn't even know if it, they would work, his pancreas would be removed, which would re render him a complete diabetic and dependent on animal enzymes for digestion, all, all the functions that the pancreas normally plays. And Dan was at uh, Stringfellow's bedside. Uh, Bill, coming off the trial, was lamenting that because of his health, he wasn't able to participate in actions of civil disobedience, and, and Dan said to him, well, your illness is your imprisonment. And Stringfellow said, yes, my preparation for the concentration camp. And his humor was wry. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, 
on the day that, uh, that there were appeals the following year, but at a certain point, uh, the nine were to turn themselves in for the sentencing. And on the day that uh, Dan was supposed to turn himself in, he held, he organized a, a big uh, festival, public event at Cornell uh, called America is Hard to Find. So he's up on stage uh, uh, speaking and the uh, federal marshals are nervous that he's not going to do this. So all the doors are covered with, with federal marshals. And also up on stage are uh, um, giant puppets with people inside them from the Bread and Puppets Theater, uh, if you know that group. There was the 12 apostles were on the stage behind him, you know, sort of uh, bringing their apostolic witness. And uh, at a certain point, one of the puppets leaned over to Dan and said, do you want to get out of here? And he said, sure. <laughs> And uh, a moment later, the lights went out. The puppeteer handed over his puppet. To, Dan went inside the puppet of Peter or John or whoever it was. The lights came back on and Dan was gone. Uh, and the puppets went out the door and into the van and, and he was driven away. Uh, and, and was underground for five months. Uh, living on the 10 most wanted list of the FBI, driving J. Edgar Hoover, Hoover uh, insane because he would pop up at well-known pulpits, you know, preach a sermon about resistance and disappear. He would be on national television and <laughs> slip out the back door and they couldn't catch him. Uh, and that was... Uh, well, it was exhausting at a certain point, five months uh, of that. Um, and at a certain point, he made overtures through the underground network to would he be welcome at Stringfellow's place on Block Island. And he hopped the ferry and, and went there. Um, down the hill from Bill's, Bill's house was on a hill. And down the hill was uh, his neighbor who was uh, very supportive of the government and thought the FBI could do anything they damn well wanted to do. Uh, Bill and Anthony later found on the, on the wall uh, of their neighbor's house a, a wooden platform that seemed to have been uh, constructed and would be suitable for aiming a directional microphone at the, at the window uh, of their uh, the picture window where the dining room table sat and where Bill and uh, Dan and Anthony talked during his uh, visit there. Uh, we've tried to FOIA to see if there's a, an FBI transcript of those conversations and it's never turned up. It would be lovely if there was. Uh, but I know of several things they talked about. Uh, Dan went underground on April 9th, which was the anniversary of uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer's execution by uh, the Nazis. And he began reading that day Eberhard Bethke's uh, biography of uh, uh, Bonhoeffer and wrote a, a review of it that appeared in, in uh, Atlantic Monthly. And one of the topics they discussed was Bonhoeffer's underground seminary at Finkenwald, which was a resistance uh, seminary and, uh, in, the, in the late 30s. And uh, Dan and Bill wondered whether it was possible to create an underground seminary in this country. They thought about Block Island as a place. The hotels are empty during the school year. And uh, uh, anyway, that was a conversation that eventually connected with my uh, experience and story with them. The other thing they talked about was the Book of Revelation. Both of them were really taken with the import of that for understanding the present historical moment. And, uh, you know, that's what Dan was teaching when he came out of Dan Barry at, uh, at Union. And that's what Bill's next book, 
uh, called An Ethic for Christians and Other Aliens in a Strange Land, really drew on the Babylon parables of, uh, of the book of Revelation. Uh, um, Dan, Dan tells the story, if you get to see the film, uh, he tells the story of the FBI coming as disguised as bird watchers and, and, uh, and arresting him. He prevented them from getting into the house, which he was glad for. Um, oh, I was going to say the third thing they may have talked about uh, was Dan was staying in a little outbuilding, which the Bill and Anthony called the manger. It had formerly been a little animal hut for a donkey or something, and uh, and had been fixed up as Anthony's study, and B Bill or Dan used it as his writing place uh, for those days. And eventually, Bill and Anthony built a cottage for Dan on the bluffs overlooking the Atlantic. It was really his hermitage, his escape place from Manhattan where he wrote. He also offered it to, uh, to other people fresh out of prison for recuperation. I honeymooned there. Uh, it, it, he, he was very generous with it, but it was also his uh, kind of hiding place. And they may have talked about whether something like that was uh, uh, possible. Um, after Dan's capture, uh, Bill and Anthony were uh, indicted for harboring a fugitive, uh, charged with a, with a, a felony. Um, and I'll just, uh, I have that here. Um, so this is their statement. Uh, following their indictment. Daniel Berrigan is our friend. We rejoice in that fact and strive to be worthy of it. Our hospitality to Daniel Berrigan is no crime. At a certain time and at a certain place, we did offer and give sustenance and lodging to him. And we did, off, uh, and we did relieve, receive, and comfort and assist him. We did not harbor or conceal him. We did not hinder the authorities. Father Berrigan has no need to be concealed. By his own ex extraordinary vocation and by the grace of God, he has become one of the most conspicuous cons Christians of these wretched times. We have done what we could to affirm him in this regard. We categorically deny that we have done anything to conceal him we are not disposed to hide what little light there is under a bushel. They were in effect being uh, prosecuted for practicing uh, the Christian virtue of hospitality, which I think Bill sort of uh, delighted in. Uh, Anthony, on the other hand, given B Bill's still frail uh, health situation, said they're trying to kill him. They're trying to kill Bill. Um, and if their response in this statement sounds extraordinary, uh, think of the host of underground uh, safe houses where night after night he was uh, met with friendship and risky hospitality, virtually improvising an underground network uh, communities, right, of relationship and friendship. Uh, virtually a, com a community of resistance and resurrection. Uh, I once heard someone ask uh, Bill what exactly he meant by resurrection. And he paused to be and he said, Dan Berrigan in prison, which seemed really cryptic <laughs> at the time. But I later heard him uh, elaborate uh, on that, reflect on le at length on a, on a visit that he made to the prisoners at, at Danbury, and how he there beheld a witness of the resurrection. 
specifically in Berrigan's demeanor. He told of arranging the visit and how the warden and the other authorities, even the chaplain, had seemed constrained, anxious, uh, dehumanized, um, unfree in the fulfillment of their functions, unable to make the most ordinary decisions without consulting the Attorney General. Whereas the prisoners, on the other hand, Dan and Phil, though certainly inconvenienced by their confinement, seem truly free uh, and joyful and unconstrained and un unencumbered by uh, their location, which is what he thought represented the radical freedom of the resurrection. Stringfellow died in uh, 1985 of the cumulative effects of uh, diabetes. Uh, um, he, in his will, I will say, uh, and I should have brought it, he left me his uh, New Testament, the one that he read in the army uh, that prompted his uh, conversion. Um, and Daniel preached uh, the funeral on the island. Uh, the New Testament was indeed at the funeral. Uh, his remarks uh, include a testimony uh, to their friendship, with which I'll conclude. This is, I'm stringing together some lines from the... Uh, a sophisticated people is struck by a shortage of words adequately to describe a bad time and how one might meet it. So we grope with negatives, non-violence, non-compliance, non-betrayal. In such a time, friendship is reduced to the bone. It becomes a matter of non-betrayal. Stringfellow saw betrayal on all sides, as indeed all but the purblind must see. The large betrayal of public trust, public monies, the public compact. What was manifestly impossible in public life, he created and cherished up close. There could exist in such a world a community of non-betrayal, non-cooperation, non-surrender. It required that the members enter a covenant, say their prayers, gather and then scatter to their work, their work, and above all, first of all, cherish one another. My encounter with this spirit of Stringfellow and his non-betraying friendship dates notoriously from 1970 and the events that occurred up the road from this chapel. I was lifted from the home of Stringfellow and trundled off the island into prison. But for those few days, Stringfellow's home was the only church I knew. It was the only safe place in the universe. And this was the aspect of Christ that this Christian kept opening before his friends. Christ was our friend. And in such a world and in such a lifetime as ours, precisely because he does not betray, he keeps covenant, he keeps his word, even with us, even when we break covenant, break our word, betray. For thousands of us, Stringfellow became the honored keeper and guardian of the word of God. That is to say, a Christian who could be trusted to keep his word, which was God's word made his own. And that word he kept and guarded and cherished now keeps him. This is the way with the word, which we name Christ. The covenant keeps us who keep the covenant. Amen.